All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob Ayer at Smirking Gun Reviews, and today we're gonna to be talking about The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, the Coen Brothers movie that they made on Netflix. And uh, yeah, so spoilers, we haven't seen this uh, movie. Uh, I do think it was a good idea that this be on Netflix. The Coen Brothers movies, you know, historically haven't been like huge money makers. Uh, they're really big with critics and fans like me. I love the Coen Brothers movies. Um, even their bad ones are better than a lot of stuff that gets put out today. Um, and so I was really excited for this. Um, but I do feel like this would have been like a box office bomb. Not because it's bad, but because it's just a, a Coen Brothers movie. <laughs> you either like it or you don't. Um, and this one has, it's because it's a bunch of vignettes, a bunch of little short stories, a bunch of more like what I think of as kind of Western fables. Um, this is a good place for it. It's really well acted. The cinematography is goddamn beautiful. Um, the writing, the script, the scripts are freaking great. Um, even, you know, I mean, I'm talking not just dialogue, I mean, just how this script was laid out, man. I love it. Um, the stories to varying degrees, though, you know, you feel certain ways about them, and I, I really do wish that they were, a lot of these were whole movies. Um, some are very short. Uh, they're mostly pretty short, um, and that's the only problem I have, is because I enjoy the world so much if each story that I really wish they would have fleshed them out to just full movies, because the Coen brothers are really great. And I just, it felt like I was just wetting my beak and wanting more. And there wasn't a single story except for the second to last uh, that I felt had kind of a good beginning, middle, and end. Um, and so let's get into this. Um, one, one thing also, this couldn't have been more perfectly timed. Um, with Red Dead Redemption 2 just being out, like, what, a couple weeks now? This is perfect for anybody that, you know, when you put down the controller, go watch this movie. Because I can see so much of these stories just being things that you could stumble upon in Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, just from either, you know, just roaming around, things that could happen, this kind of fits in that kind of world. Um, and so, uh, let's start with Ballad of Buster Scruggs. So, Tim Blake Nelson uh, is great in this. As and, and what I think I take away from this story is that just because somebody's wearing white and just because somebody's wearing black doesn't make them good or evil. Because... Um, Tim Blake Nelson's Buster Scruggs is a very cheerful man who's got a song in his heart, but he's got a no problem whatsoever with taking a life. That cheery demeanor hides a pretty sick person, <laughs> as, as they find out in this. And it's done deliciously evil. Like, I just feel like it's just so... <laughs> I and it was really made me mad that it was over so quickly because he's a crack shot to an insane degree. Um, the scene with him and Clancy Brown, I mean, I was just about if it wasn't so early in the morning and I was afraid of waking anybody else up, I would have been dying on the floor laughing my ass off. Um, but yeah, it's, it, he's wearing white and he's confronted by a man in black. And you'd think, you know, well, you know, usually in Westerns, the guy in white is the good guy. The guy in black is a bad guy. Um, and in this, it's more like a retribution. Somebody has finally come to stop him, track him down. But really, it's more of a, this guy, you know, ends up being better than him. And so not necessarily good. But I just, I just like the, the thought of the whole kind of flipping on its head, the whole white hat, black hat thing a little bit here. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I could go into greater detail, but I don't have like <laughs> a ton of time. But it starts out really great. And again, all the cinematography throughout this is just fantastic. Uh, the second story, um, gosh, I almost forgot what it was. So um, hang on one second. <laughs> 
All right, so yeah, the second part is with James Franco, where he's just, it's a simple story. This guy goes and finds this very lonely and in the middle of nowhere bank. Uh, the bank teller is Stephen Root, who is a veteran of uh, Coen Brothers movies. He is fantastic as this, just this little weird old guy in a bank that Franco decides to rob. It doesn't go well. <laughs> Just like many of the stories in here, things just don't go well. It is a theme, uh, and it's very dark. This movie is very dark. I should have said that earlier. Like, it's so dark. But more, like, realistic, because the old West, man, like, I see why people kind of, like, get the... that they like playing games like Red Dead, because it's just this last, you know, for America, it's really the last, you know, if you don't do a World War II game, it's really, like... The only weird, you know, like big open spaces and 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 harshness uh, that make kind of for great games and great movies, great stories. And uh, <clears throat> in this, I mean, it's just another harsh tale of, you know, screw ups. The guy screws up. He gets caught by Stephen Root, who is wearing. <laughs> he's got pots and pans tied all over him, as like like body armor. It is fantastic. So Franco ends up caught. These guys go to hang him, and then he is saved by a tribe of India, uh, you know, a group of Indians that come and kill all these guys, which is done freaking incredibly. The 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 attack is so freaking crazy, um, and he ends up eventually getting away. And the guy who saves him, you know, he ends up teaming up with him. He's driving cattle and so he gets out of this terrible situation that he put himself in and then ends up inadvertently being a part of a cattle rustler's scheme so the guy who saves him he thinks he's saved by this great person turns out he's just another criminal and so he inadvertently he's he didn't do anything in this situation he just happened to stumble on this you know this guy stumbles on him brings him in and now he's on the hoof for cattle rustling and is hanged for it at the end. Um, so I really like this little like message, you know, it's kind of like he escapes, uh, you know, justice for what he actually did and is convicted and killed for what he doesn't. <laughs> so it's a nice little, I don't know, there's a moral there somewhere, I guess. Um, and Franco, God, you know, Franco's in everything, isn't he? Um, whether you like him or not. <laughs> um, so the third story, let's see. Um, so this third story with Liam Neeson, uh, where he plays like a traveling uh, entertainer whose main entertainment, you know, his, his bread and butter is this uh, quadriplegic. Well, not quadriplegic, like... Uh, the guy's got no arms and legs. They call him a thrush. <laughs> and... Again, it's just this sad story of these two, this guy is his meal ticket. He goes and does dramatic uh, stories. He tells like readings of things, you know, Igazimandius and things like that. Uh, for, you know, Lincoln's speech and the Gettysburg Address or whatever. Um, and it's just this harsh tale of what it's like out there and how as long as the money is there, he's willing to take care of this guy. But once the money dries up, he is replaced by a chicken who supposedly knows how to add and subtract. And I've heard about this. I've seen this before, this chicken act. Um, and it's just how shitty is your life already? You have no arms. You have no legs. You are completely dependent on someone who doesn't really, in the end, give a shit about you. And, you know, you don't know their beginnings. You don't know anything about it. All you know is that eventually this man becomes a burden on this on Liam Neeson's character and finds it easier to just take care of a chicken. And we don't see his death, thankfully. I really don't think I could have handled seeing a man with no arms and no legs getting dropped off a railroad tr track bridge into the water to drown. Um, it's really brutal, though, thinking about it. It's stuck in my head. Um, just as much as it would have been if he had actually shown it. And just really sad and harsh and the brutality of all of it. You know, the how fragile and just 
terrible the West was. Um, and so, uh, you know, like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really want to talk about this one that much because it really bothered me. <laughs> really, really, this one is uh, like my least favorite because it just really bothered me because just, you know, the harshness of it is a little too real to what, you know, like what people are capable of. So let's just get to the next part. All right, so in this part, Tom Waits plays this guy who finds this pristine area um, untouched by man. And that is kind of the theme of this one, really, is this really beautiful, beautiful valley. I don't know how much of it is actually there, um, if any of it's like a map painting or whatever, because it's stunning. Um, but there is like the use of CGI deer and things like this. And it's just, I think this is kind of basically telling them the story of man, really, and what we do. That there's per paradise, and then man shows up and starts digging it up, looking for things, you know, as we do. We, you know, I've never understood the whole panning for gold thing. Like, and, and, I mean, as far as like, we put value on things that are just really, we just say they have value. Like, uh, suddenly somebody could go, you know, remote controls, they're like gold. Why? I don't know. It's like the, if all of a sudden there was only one of these, you know, the demand, you know, like, it's, it's crazy. But, so man goes in, starts digging up this area to try to find the thing that's valuable. And then, you know, as I suspected uh, very early on in this, that somebody else was going to come along as soon as he found gold. <laughs> And he does. And this, this part was pretty good, and this was very Coen Brothers, because, you know, the guy's sitting there waiting as the character is dead, you think, and the, you know, Tom Waits' character is just dead there after he finds gold. Until the tables are turned, he gets into the, the guy that shoots, shot him, gets into the little hole, and the tables are turned, and he kills him. And this guy, you know, and so he then just, you know, he gets his gold, puts it on the back of his horse, his mule, and throws the guy in the dirt and then leaves. And, you know, the animals come back, the fish come back, the butterflies come back, the deer comes back, and man just kind of disappears and things go back to normal. And I, I do feel like that's definitely saying something about us and the planet in a very simple story. Um, uh, Tom Waits is great in this, is just this guy out there. But I do, I do feel like that's what it's saying. You know, that we come, we, we have conflict, and then we're gone, and things carry on. So, I don't know. It was a, it's a pretty interesting little morality tale. Uh, so let's go to the next one. All right, so this, all right, so this, this part of the story uh, has the most, like, complete actual story in it. And it's also just really tragic in the end where it's just this girl and her brother going off to Oregon uh, to, you know, start a life. He's kind of a unscrupulous or kind of, uns you know, not a very smart businessman. He seems more like a good of a con man slash mo just kind of idiot um, who's going to try to marry her off to his business partner out in Oregon. They go out there, but he dies, leaves her with his dog and his wagon and the guy that they hired to bring their stuff out there that they can't pay now uh, because they buried her brother with uh, his money in an unmarked grave out in the middle of nowhere. And so it's her trying to figure out what she's going to do as she meets this guy, Billy Knapp, who eventually um, decides that, you know, seeing what kind of life this is out there, and seeing who, his boss and everything who, you know, he, he's never going to have a family and he wants one. And he, they end up kind of like deciding to get married. Well, first he tries to kill her dog, which does not work. And then she eventually gets herself into a big bit of trouble with Indians. Uh, she goes out uh, to find the dog that he didn't kill. And when his boss, Billy's boss, goes to find her... Uh, she's looking at prairie dogs, and they get trapped in a situation that they can't get back away from these Indians that are going to try to kill them. And again, this is a really great little action piece, but again, it's, it's sad and like how you know, ill-prepared people are because she ends up killing herself uh, 
because she thought he had died. He had given her a gun saying, if I am done for, you should kill yourself because, and he goes into great detail about what they'll do to you if you are, if they catch you. And it's pretty terrible. <laughs> and so she's really scared. And in a moment, she thinks he has died and she takes herself out. She did not wait. Her fear took over. And it's really sad. It, it's a really good story, but it's really sad again because she did not have to do this. And then you get this shot of this man who is stuck in his life and he was ready to move forward. And now he pretty much will probably just go right back to being what he was, which is, a you know, without the prospect now of her, uh, he'll probably just continue on with the wagon trains. Um, and it's... It's a nice little story, but it, again, it's just really sad. <laughs> it's just really sad. And so, I don't know. I don't really have much more to say about it. Now, now the last bit of this is the final uh, episode. It's got a uh, well, little vignette. It's got Brendan Gleeson and Tyne Daly and Saul Rupinek, who I love. Uh, and this guy with the beard. I, I can't recall his name, but he's been in a ton of things. Um, and I pretty much think that this is like... So there's these two bounty hunters on this carriage that won't stop all until it gets to its destination. And then these three kind of talk about people uh, to differing like opinions on what people are like. I love that this does kind of re-bring back the old saying from Miller's Crossing, another Coen Brothers movie about uh, where Gabriel Byrne says, uh, nobody knows anybody, not that well. And that's kind of brought up in this, that we really don't know people. Like, we can try to put them in boxes. We can say there's good, there's evil, there's dead, there's alive. There's, you know, all these different ways to look at how human beings are. The one guy says we're like ferrets. <laughs> um, and so they have this kind of philosophical discussion about life and death and people. And in the end, you know, when they finally get to their... Uh, destination, you kind of get the idea that even though these guys called themselves bounty hunters, uh, the way they describe their, the way they do things, like one's the storyteller, one's the one who distracts you, so that while he's telling you the story, the other one takes you out. And it almost, I don't know if it's like, I don't want to say like God and the devil or what, but <laughs> they get there and they're very scared to go into the building. And it kind of is like, were they taken to the afterlife? You don't really know. The stairs kind of go up to like a lit place. It's, it's very just dark and gloomy. And one of the, the bounty hunters talks about how he likes to look into the eyes of the people that they've killed um, as they're dying to see if they can understand what is happening and where they're going. And that when asked, you know, have any of them succeeded, he's like, oh, I don't know. I, I've only been watching. And Saul Rubinick's look on his face as he's kind of contemplating going into the building at the end. Um, and kind of puts his hat on and taps. It kind of feels like he's accepted whatever's about to happen. And he closes the door in that scene in the movie. Um, and so there's a lot of like, this whole thing has got lots of little morality tales and fables, parts of it. And it's really good. But again, I really wish that I could have gotten like, full movies out of these or like this could have been like a uh, like a uh, uh, like the haunting of hill house you know kind of a limited series where they could have made these uh, little stories longer you know um or like the romanoffs on amazon that has like you know some of them are like an hour 20 hour and 27 minutes i would have really liked to have seen these more fleshed out um and i think that's my only gripe because the acting and the writing and the cinematography and, and everything and the realism and the, you know, just that feeling of the old West and how harsh everything was, it, it's all captured here brilliantly. I just didn't get enough of it. And that's my only gripe is I want more. And so I hope that there's more Coen Brothers stuff coming on Netflix because I really dig them. I can never get enough Coen Brothers. So if you do like the Coen Brothers, you will like the style of this, you may feel the same way, that this does feel like an incomplete movie just because you want more. And so that's about it. That's all I gotta say about it. So anyway, uh, this is Rob at Smirking Gun Review saying, if you liked this video, please hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, all that jazz, hit the bell for all notifications. Otherwise, we will see you on the next video. Thanks for watching this. Thanks for all the support and take care.